Because the whole thing is about celebrating the texture of the sweet and sour pork in this guava roe, we're going to season it very, very simply. Three things. First, salt. Second, little splash of Shaoxing wine. And then just a pinch of white pepper because we want to balance out those aromatics. Oh, and I'm squeezing it, really sort of working it in there. Now we're gonna move on to the deep frying of the pork and the building of the basic sweet and sour sauce. So just as we started before, we're gonna combine a cup of vinegar with a cup of white sugar. Okay, so here's the deal, right? <clears throat> sweet and sour sauce. This is the first sauce that I was taught how to make at my first restaurant job when I didn't know how to cook. It's a ridiculously simple sauce and I can't honestly believe that I'm here to tell you guys about it. But it is a good exercise in building flavor profiles. It's a good exercise in the concept of mother sauces beyond European, beyond French cooking. At the end of the day, sweet and sour is the sweetness, which is white sugar, and the sourness, which is white vinegar. The ratio of the two is one to one by volume. So if you have a cup of sugar, it's a cup of vinegar. No finesse to it, that, that, that's it. That's the end of the video. If we were to use this as a base sauce, we can start interrogating other flavor profiles. The question is like, what other ingredients can we bring into this basic mix to change the way it can be applied, the way it can be used. There are two things usually with food, right? The first is taste, the second is texture. For taste, it's based off of the ingredients and the way we cook it. For the texture, especially for sauces, it's just about viscosity and thickness. So little tiny simple stuff like a sweet and sour sauce, we can get a really quite technical and really sort of at least thoughtful about it. We could actually talk about this for ages. So sweet and sour um, is the Anglo-Saxonic American English word for it, right? Um, it's also known as agrodolce, right? It's also known as a gastrique in France. Um, uh, it's a huge part of building a lot of Filipino sauces, Southeast Asian sauces. Um, every, almost every culture has a sweet and sour sauce. So today, three things. The first is a dipping sauce. We're going to make it for spring rolls, I believe. So as simple as the spring rolls are, and they're frozen, <laughs> I didn't make them on my own, definitely not. For a simple thing like spring rolls, we're going to build a more complicated, fruitier sweet and sour sauce. The second is going to be an herb salad, sort of a uh, Southeast Asian-ish herb salad that's going to have a little bit of fish sauce to give a little bit of that salinity, as well as other forms of sourness. The third is the most complicated dish, Northeastern Chinese style wobaro, which is a sweet and sour pork. The, because the dish itself, the pork and all the aromatics are so complicated, we're gonna make a very, very simple sweet and sour sauce. It's almost as if the more complicated your main ingredient, the simpler the sauce and vice versa. Whenever we have any issue with our sweet and sour sauces, this is where we start at the restaurant. We just start with the most basic to remind ourselves of what balance feels and tastes like. Not to overcomplicate things too much, but you could put sugar in first and then vinegar, but we'll get to that a little bit later. We're just gonna combine the two into the pot, if that's okay with everybody. Yeah. <laughs> We're bringing it to a boil because all we want to do is dissolve the sugar. That's the most basic step. Do you have to stir? Not really. It's like when you're making a caramel, if you stir too much, some of the sugar crystals will end up on the side and might cause your pot to char. Um, but you can, but there's so much liquid in here that it doesn't really make a difference. It is the simplest thing in the world. We're just aiming to first and foremost, bring the sauce to a boil. And number two, get the sugar dissolved. Once the liquid ceases to be opaque, we're happy. See those big bubbles? That's what boiling is. Small bubbles, not boiling. The whole studio now is filled with a very aggressive uh, uh, scent of vinegar. It's a little too much to handle, especially at this distance to the pot. But, <clears throat> but that's what's supposed to happen. We're heating the vinegar to tame some of this acetic acid. Now, this is where you start to get control over the texture of your sweet and sour, of your basic sweet and sour. If we turn this off and left this as is, you would get a very liquidy, watery sauce. Now, this is not a bad thing. If you don't need that sauce to coat anything, this is a good place to stop. For example, if you're using this maybe in a marinade or you are using this to maybe even add to a drink, for example, this is totally fine. But how long we boil it, means more of the water is gonna be evaporated from the vinegar, and that's gonna concentrate the sauce. 
Once this boils, that's also the indication that now is a good time to add your other ingredients, whatever you're doing. I'm literally crying because of so much vinegar in my face. Because it's boiling, that heat's gonna help break down some of those cell walls so that all those flavors start to infuse. If you add your stuff too late, the flavors won't have a sufficient amount of time to come together. If you add it too early, you don't have as much control over the texture that you, you'd like. When we build those other sauces, think to yourself, which ingredients do I want to add when this sauce is boiling hot? And which ingredients do I want to add off the heat? There are some flavors that need that heat to help break down. There are other flavors that you don't want to cook off and you want to keep fresh. Also, there are other things that are a little stinky that you don't want all over your apartment or your kitchen or whatever, like fish sauce. So some of those things we like to add off the heat. Can you overboil this? Yes, you can. Let's say it gets way too thick. In that case, just add the water back because the water is evaporated. If you just add water back, you'll just thin it back out and you can do it again. It's really, really, really flexible. At this stage, how long has it been? Like three, four minutes or so? Like we're here. I would call this like salad dressing, vegetable dressing level vinegar sauce. If you reduce it by half, so you only have one cup yield, I think that's when it becomes sort of dipping sauce level. So about five minutes later, this is where we're at. And it's actually picked up a little bit of that golden hue. This I would call close to dipping sauce territory. Reduced almost, almost a little bit more than half. It's sticky, it's like honey, right? So this is dipping sauce territory. Any further than this, once you cool it down, it, it won't move really in the refrigerator. But this level I would also use to coat maybe sticky pieces uh, like sweet and sour pork. Again, it feels a little liquid, but once it cools down on something like a metal spoon, like. It's a candy. First variation of the base sweet and sour sauce. This is going to be a dipping sauce inspired by Cantonese or Cantonese American red sweet and sour sauce. But we're gonna take it to the next level um, past the ordinary stuff that you get in a packet. It's quite a simple thing. We've chosen a bunch of ingredients that look good together because everything's red. We're aiming for that red color, right? We're gonna be dipping spring rolls in this today, but it all starts the same as with the original, vinegar and sugar. We're just gonna bring it together. We're gonna wait for it to boil. At this stage, we can see through to the bottom so we know that all of the sugar has been dissolved. That's when we're gonna add everything else almost basically at the same time. The first thing that needs to go in is probably the hibiscus and the hot flakes. We're gonna turn it down to a simmer because we need this to infuse. We need everything that's soluble to dissolve fully. So we're gonna do that at a lower temperature. That's what the hot flakes are for. Anything that needs to be infused like a tea that requires a lower temperature to slowly hydrate it and therefore coax out those flavor compounds like the hibiscus, we want to add at an earlier stage. I'm just stirring occasionally to help break up that hot flake and try to get everything to slowly pick up that color. Hibiscus and hot flakes together are actually a very traditional way of making sweet and sour sauce um, in the Cantonese proper traditional method. That's why now when we go to Cantonese American or Chinese American takeout restaurants and you order sweet and sour, the sauce is red because originally it would have been dyed red with hot flakes. So once I notice that the hot flakes are hydrated and they're starting to break up, we can add some of the other ingredients. So pineapple juice, a little bit of fruitiness, some vinegar to bolster that vinegar flavor and to balance out some of the sweetness that we're adding via the hot flakes. The hot flakes are made primarily of sugar, so you need to add a little bit more vinegar to balance that out. The strawberries, we're cooking it almost as if it's a jam, so it's gonna sort of hold its shape, but most of the flavors and the color is gonna end up in the sauce. And then the umeboshi has a pit in the middle, so the best thing to do is probably to take out that pit. And then the whole thing can go in, it'll slowly dissolve, and break up, I mean, we can mash it up with our whisk. So that's a little bit of saltiness in there. There also is a little bit of pectin in some of the fruits, which will um, help it come together as well. The chilies we're gonna leave until the end because we don't want to cook them too much because we don't want this to be super, super spicy. Acidity tends to make your mouth sort of like pucker and, the sh and sweetness tends to like concentrate things. So this chili, the little bit of the tingle really sort of completes that sort of like mouth feel. And again, 
Spring rolls, very, very simple for like frying frozen spring rolls. That's why we're putting so much effort into building a more complicated and delicately layered sweet and sour sauce. This is your typical red sweet and sour sauce, but taken to volume 11. 11, oh, 11, and most of 11, the and then amps go up to 10. Exactly. Does that mean it's louder? Is it any louder? Well, it's one louder, isn't it? This is a cool pot, actually. It's pretty good. Is it a 52? Mm -hmm. it's, like that ja it's like the Japanese aluminum pots that they like to use. Here's how I like to tell when the dipping sauce is ready. You see those bubbles? Once these bubbles are larger like this and they feel like they're foaming, that's when it's almost a caramel consistency. At, once that happens, you have to turn it off almost immediately. Otherwise, it's gonna be way too thick. And on a spoon, this is what you're looking for. Now to strain it. Press out all the goodness. All of this is just strawberry puree that you're mashing in there that itself is gonna thicken the sauce. That's a dipping sweet and sour. Now, it's a little loose right now at this temperature, but as we cool it down, it's gonna to get to that perfect dipping texture. Because I didn't want to cook the chilies all the way, I didn't want them to soften too much. As this sauce is still warm, I'm gonna add the chilies. If I let this sauce sit overnight, which you totally could, usually as basic sweet and sour sauce like this, you can let it sit for, you know, a week seven days, um, it's just gonna get spicier and spicier because this is the only thing left in that sauce that's gonna infuse over time. Quick note about the temperature of sweet and sour sauce. When sweet and sour sauce is hot, it tastes a lot more acidic and it's gonna be a lot thinner than when it's cooled down. So I think it's really important, especially in dipping context where the final sauce itself is not gonna be hot, for you to cool down that sweet and sour and let it rest a little bit. You want all the volatile compounds to sit and chill, and you also want the thickness to be where it's supposed to be. And it should look a little bit closer to this. It's called viscosity, but your hope here is that when you dip a piece of whatever snack or appetizer in there, it should barely cling to the sides. The idea, right? Perfect scenario is I'll dip this in and that's the perfect amount of sauce to balance everything else that's going on inside of the appetizer. Pow! Like that's a, you know that ratatouille scene when he's eating cheese with the strawberries and the fireworks? Salad dressing. This is the second iteration of sweet and sour. What we're aiming for here is a punchy, aromatic, lightened up salad dressing based on that basic sweet and sour. It's gonna start in the same place. A cup of sugar and then a cup of vinegar. Actually, should I do the cool thing? We're gonna make a caramel. So the way that's gonna work is, yes, the ingredients for the base is still the same. It's still white sugar and white vinegar, but we're gonna caramelize the sugar just a tiny bit. Over medium heat, sugar directly into the pan. Gonna let it slowly turn, just gently, gently, gently brown. And that's gonna let, the heat is gonna coax that caramel color out of the sugar so that we don't have to over reduce it to get the same, the same color. So here's the thing, we're not making a strict caramel, so we don't have to be super careful about it. As long as you're picking up a little bit of color, like you see there, right? Is it bubbling up? We can let the vinegar go in. <laughs> I want you to just learn how to make a caramel and then you can make any caramel it, using this exact same method. Regardless of what the recipe tells you, the part of like making the sugar into caramel, you can follow your own technique there. Just let it all come together. The beginner is cold, which is why it's seizing up, but we have a little bit of caramel flavor in here, which just gives it a more depth of flavor. We just wait for all of that sugar to melt into the vinegar. This is when we're gonna add everything else. So roughly speaking, in my experience, it's been a four, four to one ratio um, between sugar and the fish sauce. Fish sauce goes in, lime juice goes in, so does the ginger, and I'm gonna throw in, in this case, the red chilies also. Actually, maybe half of it. Bring it all together. We're gonna also add the lychee for a little bit of extra sweetness. These are just halved lychees that are pitted. And we're gonna let all of this infuse together for a couple of minutes. Again, we don't have to reduce this too much. We're using this as a dressing, so we're gonna keep it nice and liquidy. This is one of those dishes that's gonna smell 
sort of overwhelming when it's very hot, but when we cool it down, it won't be as intense. I would describe this texture as similar to tea. Cool. Very, very light. That's a basic dressing. Let's put together a quick herb salad with our zingy sauce that has now been chilled. So endives, nice bitter note, and also very, very pretty. Bunch of Thai basil, a generous amount, picked, cleaned, some cilantro, apple slices for sweetness. I mean, this is a salad. You can put in whatever you'd like. And then the radishes for color. And just to finish off this sauce, after it's been cooled down, I know it's gonna sit in the fridge for a little while. So I wanted to infuse it with a little bit of color so it looks good, but I also wanted to introduce ingredients that um, wouldn't necessarily um, uh, benefit from it being infused over heat. First, some diced up chilies, and then the zest of the entire lime. Nice, juicy, fresh, green stuff. It's gonna float inside of this beautiful golden brown liquid. Just gonna mix this up, bring this all together. So you have these little floaty bits inside of it. Way too much dressing, definitely don't pour all, all of it in. Just a little bit over the top, the tiniest amount. And then bring the whole thing together. Then I'll go half of the peanuts, half of the shallots. Fried shallots for crispy, 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 sweet, sour. That's what we're aiming for. Same sweet and sour. A little bit of citric acidity from lime juice and lime zest. A little bit of chili for heat, different dimension. And then fish sauce, round it off. Give it that Southeast Asian edge. Perfect salad dressing. Now everybody knows sweet and sour pork. They think of those tiny little nuggets that are coated in this bright red sauce, sometimes made with Kool-Aid, sometimes made with cranberry sauce, sometimes made with uh, red, was it, what is it, red 40? That's a very specific style, but there's actually sweet and sour pork variations all throughout China. The one that I'm the most excited about is this northeastern style one called Guo Ba Rou. Not many people know about it outside of China because there aren't that many northeastern style Chinese restaurants in the US, but it's built off of a very, of a very, very simple sweet and sour sauce. It's about celebrating the texture of the crispy pork, so that's why the sauce is so, so, so simple. This recipe in and of itself could be a separate video. Pork shoulder, this has come uh, purchased pre-sliced. Pork shoulder is probably the best cut for this. An alternative might be pork belly if you like things a little bit fattier. What I don't want to use is pork loin or pork chop, as we call it here. This fat vein, these rivers of, of fat that run through the pork shoulder are gonna give it nice, delicate marble texture. Now, when it comes in like this, we have to marinate it, and we are not gonna be too shy about really working the flavors into the pork. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna try to get it nice and flat. If you buy a whole pork shoulder, it's the best thing to do is put it in the freezer for about 15 minutes or so, slice thin slices like this, and then we're just gonna pound it flat. With the back of the cleaver, we're extending the protein strands, which are gonna help tenderize the pork, as, just, as well as just giving it a little bit of volume. Usually the best way to do it is to go through it once, in one direction, and then go through it a second time, a second direction. Now, Guaro in some northern Chinese restaurants, they have the whole piece this big. You just defry the whole thing and it's actually quite exciting to eat it like this. Um, but if you want it to be a little easier to handle, you can just cut in half or even quarters and that would be a decent piece of sweet and sour pork. We're not looking for nuggets here, we're looking for sort of like flat slices. pork shoulder that's become, that's flattened out. We are not going to be allergic to really massaging and touching our meat today. Because the whole thing is about celebrating the texture of the sweet and sour pork in this guava roe, we're going to season it very, very simply. Three things. First, salt. So this is half a tablespoon for about half a pound of pork. Second, little splash of Xiaoxing wine or any sort of rice wine. We're not trying to add too much liquid to this at all. And then just a pinch of white pepper because we want to balance out um, those aromatics. Oh, and I'm squeezing it, really sort of working it in there. We're sort of trying to move this stuff in here. And as we're squeezing it, just like we're using the back of the cleaver, it's gonna help tenderize your meat. Do this for at least, or have this after it's marinated, 
let it sit for at least 30, 30 minutes. Overnight works as well. Um, it's a very, very bare mar marinade. The salt is going to help lock in all those natural juices. We're not adding too much here. People are so afraid to touch their meat as if there's something really sacred about it. Pork is ready. Now we're going to move on to the deep frying of the pork and the building of the basic sweet and sour sauce. So just as we started before, we're going to combine a cup of vinegar with a cup of white sugar. The difference between this and the first base is we're going to we're not going to thicken it as much and the only addition is going to be a little bit of lemon juice just to give it a little bit of that citric edge. Okay. Bring this to a boil and then reduce it for a couple of minutes. Um, if it's as thick as a dipping sauce, um, it's gonna have a really, really hard time coating each piece of pork. So that's the balance that you're looking for. And since we are gonna be stir frying the pork at the end, we don't need to keep in mind that this sauce will get uh, sort of colder um, before we manipulate it. So just get it to the texture that you want to get it to. Think of the sweet and sour pork that you grew up eating and that you love, that's what we're looking for. The thought behind the lemon juice is that the acidity, it's always interesting to approach similar flavors through different ingredients, right? So the acidity of vinegar is different from the acidity of citrus. So when you combine the two, it just complicates it just the tiniest bit. We are keeping it a clear color, so we're not gonna give it any soy sauce, we're not gonna give it any cranberry juice, we're not gonna give it any ketchup. It's just gonna be clear so that you can see the texture of the pork. Okay, let's build the batter. So here's the pork, marinated for about 30 minutes. The 30 minutes is only to make sure that that salt is locked in there. But as that's sort of marinating, this is a really quite interesting and cool Chinese restaurant technique for building ublek or starch-based batters. Oftentimes when we're deep frying, we think of batters as you take a piece of meat or you take a piece of ingredient, you dip it inside of the batter and then you deep fry it. This is a little different. Because of that crispy texture that we're looking for, you actually want as little batter on there as possible. So we're going to be building a batter and then adding it to the pork. This is potato starch, which is just better corn starch. It behaves almost identically, um, but corn starch will work as well. And we're just gonna add a lot of water, a lot more water than you actually need to the batter. And we're just gonna bring it together. Actually, honestly, the easiest way to do this with your hands. All I'm doing here is I'm uh, going through the bowl, making sure that there are no clumps left. And then we're gonna let this sit room temperature for at least 30 minutes. What I'm looking for is for the potato starch to absorb as much water as it can, and then the rest of the water is gonna float to the top, and then we're gonna drain that off so that we have the perfect consistency. There's almost no need to measure, just way too much water than starch and just let it separate. As much water as you can, and keep the starches on the bottom. This is the perfect consistency of fully hydrated potato starch. We're going to, um, be adding the starch into the pork slowly, a little bit at a time. What I'm looking for is for the starch to barely coat, barely, barely coat the pork. You want to faintly, faintly see pink, a little bit at a time. I'm just massaging it in there. Now if it is a little bit dry and it is a little bit chalky, and give it a little bit more, tiny bit of water. Just so it's like malleable. So we have a nice thin coating. No breadcrumbs, no AP flour, none of that stuff. Just starch doing weird things at different temperatures. So three fries, first fry, 325. That's to set the shape. The second is at 375, which is to cook the pork. The third fry is to just give it a little bit of color, which is at around 400 degrees. If you're frying with oil that can reach 400 degrees, then that's what you should be using. Um, it could be peanut, it could be rice bran, it could be soybean or canola vegetable, whatever you'd like to use. The pork's all coated, the oil's up to temp. We're gonna fry the smallest piece of pork we have to make sure that it's doing what it's supposed to be doing. This first fry is to set the shape, so let's try to get it as flat as possible as we drop it in. It's a pretty low temp, so it's not gonna bubble immediately, but we can do the swishy thing to start to get it to float as the water molecules inside start to bubble. This whole thing is gonna come back up. Don't touch it too much, because you don't wanna move the batter off in the beginning, but you see those bubbles happening? That's that potato starch doing that ma magic. We're probably gonna be here for about a minute or two. That's very nice. That's, that's the shape set. 
Pork is not cooked, collar's not in, that's why it doesn't look good. But that's where we're gonna start. So do the pieces a little bit at a time. Be gentle with it before you drop them in. The end of this recipe is gonna be a little bit of a stir fry, which means that this sauce is gonna hit heat again. So it's gonna reduce more. You can over reduce it now, but you can't under reduce it. So for safety's sake, we're gonna turn that off, call it a day. I do not want to cook off too much of that citric flavor. So once this is off the heat, I'm just gonna wait for those bubbles to die down and then the lemon juice can go in. Just stir it, incorporate it. Just a hint of flavor. That smells good. Look, look at that. How fun is that? Look, look at that better. There you go. This is the perfect piece here. That. It's gonna be crispy on the outside, it's gonna taste like pork. Turn this up. Here goes the pork. You hear that bubble? That's a second fry. We're just trying to cook the pork here. It'll pick up a little bit of color, and if it needs more color, we'll do the third fry. This is 375 for about a minute to finish cooking the pork. Crispiness is really simple. As water molecules evaporate, they punch through the surface, and if you have a layer of starch that can harden during that process, it'll capture those air bubbles, and that's what crispiness is. Okay, you guys are out. Right? At this point, it should be pretty much crispy, and the pork should pretty much be cooked. There might be a little bit of deviation in the color where the pork is starting to poke through, or you might get a little bit of scraggly like starch bits that are starting to caramelize and turn brown. That's a good thing. This is what you want. Most of the time, we like to fry at least twice um, to make sure that things are crispy, and letting them sort of aerate and rest a little between the fry is important so that you don't overcook the inside. Also, you give the starch a little, scent, uh, a little break so that when it fries again, it can harden. The bubbles are most, more subtle now because most of the moisture has already evaporated. We're just looking for color here. Maximum heat, stiffen up that crust. There you go. Yeah, you see that caramelization? That's good. That's where we want to be. Final steps for the sweet and sour pork. Our sweet and sour sauce has lemon juice in it. It's reduced a little, but not to the final consistency. We're gonna do that in the wok here during the stir fry. Wok is smoking, so it's hot. We're gonna add about a tablespoon of oil, swirl it around. Once it starts to shimmer, like it has those little ripples, those dimples, it's hot. We're on sort of medium heat. I'm not trying to brown the garlic, I just want the flavors to infuse. So first thing that's gonna go in is ginger. Garlic goes in next. Just move it around. Once you start to smell that acrid garlic taste slowly go away, sweet and sour sauce is gonna go in. Okay, what I'm looking for here, bubbles. About a third of it. Now we're starting to build a ginger garlic sauce. What's special about this sweet and sour sauce, unlike the others, is that there's a little bit of oil in it, right? When we started the wok, that little bit. <laughs> Flavor for compounds are soluble, usually in either fat or water. There are some things like ginger and garlic that really, really blossom in oil. So that's why we had oil in this sweet and sour sauce um, and why it's important to activate those aromatics in the oil and not directly in the liquid, in the water rather. Okay, so this is pretty good, right? I feel like sweet and sour consistency. It might be actually a little bit too thick, so I might just give it a little touch, fix it there. But those big bubbles, when they start to slow, that's when you know that the air bubbles are being trapped by some type of syrup. So as that's happening, pork's gonna go in. All of it. What I'm looking for is the sugariness and the stickiness of that sauce to naturally coat each piece of pork. So if we're feeling a little Oh no! Oh, that's gonna be a mess. All right, so just toss it, finish tossing it. So that every piece is coated in this little bit of a shiny thing. And then, if you need more sauce, you can always add a little bit more sauce.
And you can see that it's a little sticky. So that's the sweet and sour. These aromatics, the scallion and the cilantro stems are there mostly for color and herbaceousness, so you don't need to cook it off that much. I'm just gonna toss it all together. The simplest, simplest sauce, bolstered by the aromatics, and then a delicately fried pork. So let's plate it. The ugly pieces at the bottom. And then the residual of the sauce, just for dramatic effect. Here's this Northeastern style Chinese sweet and sour pork. The cool thing about this is that after you've fried it and you've tossed it in that sweet glaze, it'll sit for a little while and the sugars on the outside will also sort of crystallize and harden. So it's almost as if you have two textures, a crispy, sticky texture of the sugar and the, natural, and the actual crispiness of the starch. It's a pretty interesting technique. It's often the final exam for a lot of like Northeastern culinary schools because it's all about like controlling your temperature and um, of, of the oil and then controlling your temperatures of the sugar or sweet and sour sauce. Mm -hmm. Those are the three ways to make sweet and sour. Three variations, three different textures, three different flavor profiles. It all starts with a base one-to-one -one vinegar and sugar sauce, but infinite possibilities from there.